This continued to fester, especially because I got a lot of downtime and I started realizing what's going on. And it wasn't until I started taking supplements while I was lifting, I took a pre-workout and the pre-workout kicked me into hyperdrive and my anxiety just snapped. And ever since that moment right there, it was like, it was like pedal to the metal. I couldn't understand why my body, it was like my body just went into some sort of shock. What do we say, fam? Welcome to Simplexity. Feels a little odd me sitting right in the center today. I'm gonna be honest with you. I feel a little- The man in the middle. A little, a little uncalibrated. However- You're a little closer, so that's good. Amen. Me and you are up close and personal. My name's Sammy Foster, joined with the one and only co-host worth having, old Bootsy. Hello there. Got your jacket on today. Why? Because fall has come. Winter is on the horizon. Fall has fallen. Fall has fallen. A little chilly this morning, is it not? Very. Brisk. Mm -hmm. Brisk. I like it. I like it a lot. Yep. However, we're not going to talk about the weather because we got a very, very special guest, long awaited for. We've, uh, we've had this in the, in, the, in the brew hopper for a minute now, haven't we? Absolutely. Yeah. Just keep talking about it, not making it happen. But today, we're making it happen. Join with us is the one and only Josh Merson. Thank you guys for having me this morning. Thanks for being here, buddy. No problem. Josh is a staple of the house here at Lighthouse. Be the fact that he is uh, he is one of the most animated worship leaders that we have. Is he not? He is. He's a I, bit of a spinner sometimes. Yeah, I like it. I like it. Yeah. Got that raspy voice. Got that hair. Let that hair out for a minute. Let, look at Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. But we're not going to talk about worship either. We're not talking about the weather. What we're not we talking talk? about worship. But really, man, I'm interested in the fact that I haven't heard the, 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 the whole story, only sort of sound bites of it. And that is um, really your time spent in the Army, mm -hmm. specifically spent in the war in Afghanistan right. during Operation Freedom. Yep. Enduring uh, freedom. Enduring freedom. Enduring freedom. Enduring freedom. Yeah. And that's not the one that they changed. It was the Iraq war in where yeah. once George W. Yeah. got on that aircraft carrier and said mission accomplished, that's when they switched that. But that wasn't that wasn't your era. No, 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 no. Actually, I was in while that happened, but it wasn't. I wasn't in Iraq. I was over there in Afghanistan, okay. which is actually a little bit different than what people would think. Uh, Afghanistan is typically something that's more mountainous, more green, huh. um, whereas Iraq is nothing but desert. But southern Afghanistan does have that desert tendency. But where we were, we were up at the highest point uh, in the Kunar province. So Kunar province. Yep. As far northeast as the troops would go. Okay. Okay. Bordered by what nation? Oh, uh, that's Pakistan. Pakistan. Okay. And you were in, um, it was really your stint that uh, you were in Afghanistan when Osama bin Laden was shot and killed. Yep. Actually, it happened on my birthday Whoa. while I was over there. No doubt. Yep. Woke up May 2nd. Actually, it technically happened in the States May 1st, but over there it was May 2nd, 2011. Man. Good birthday present. Yeah, <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. Well, man, what um, really subject matter is today is not only do I want to say thank you for your service, and um, we around here at Lighthouse Church are pro-military, pro-gratitude, and uh, we really, and we say it often, are the freedoms that we so often take for granted are paid for by the blood, sweat, and tears of men and women that serve on foreign soil and protect us and our borders. And so to you, I mean it when I say it, buddy, thank you. And, uh, and yet I know that your stint over there, it, wasn't, it didn't happen in a vacuum. You came home and then suffered uh, from PTSD. Yep. And, um, and that's been part of your journey now of where I really think that your story can help a lot of people that are dealing with trauma, stress, um, maybe not even identified it as such, yep. but are dealing with anxiety, worry, and all of the manifestations that come with it. Sort of give me a background because, you know, I was reading last night 
I'm sorry, I'm talking a lot, but I, but I, but I, I got I got I got a lot of questions, a lot of thoughts around this. Whereas, oftentimes, what the National Center for PTSD has said is that a lot of people claim to have, you know, post-traumatic stress syndrome or um, a dysfunction, but because of the trauma that they went through, when in fact, um, we've gotten a little too slap happy with. Mm-hmm. PTSD, where in fact only 5% of males in America truly do have PTSD, whereas 8% of women have it. So those numbers were much less than I thought. Mm -hmm. But um, when it comes to that, you had a legitimate case of it. Yeah, I mean, I was very mild in comparison to what some of my friends and and, and guys that I have known for a long time have had. But I did have what I would say a minor case and still do. And, wh- and what does that look like and what was that a result of? Give me the story, if um, you will. I'm gonna go all the way from the beginning and set some context. I grew up in the fundamental, independent fundamental Baptist church. Um, That'll I, cause you some PTSD. Yeah, 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 yeah. So my brother actually graduated with John. I went to school with Cam. Cam was actually a student of my mom's, I believe. <laughs> For the record, I had a very different experience than you did, but uh, I started going in sixth grade. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So, so you might have had her for a little recess. Um, <laughs> <laughs> unless you had detention. Um, but never. No. I, n- I never got a single demerit. Are you serious? Oh. I had so many. No. <laughs> nope. <laughs> I can't give you a high five for that, brother. I'm not. Okay. Well, back to I, you, Josh. Yeah. <laughs> I was all the way back um, when I was back in school and church and stuff like that. I grew up in an era where a lot of everything was based off of fear. So we had a fear of what was going to happen. It wasn't why do we believe what we believe. It was more what do we not want to happen. And so when you have that, we went to uh, Christian camps every summer. We went to Christian camps for our senior trip. We went, you know, so many different places. We did a lot of, of, you know, door-to-door evangelism, and that'll give you PTSD right there with all the people in Glen Burnie shutting their (laughs) door in your face. face. But uh, so we have all this stuff that you know, everything's based out of fear. So there's already that anxiety that has been brewing. And then after um, I had graduated, I went to the good old, and and I think I can say this, is Bob Jones University. Um, I only lasted a semester. I got kicked out. Um, (laughs) Apparently the Mersons don't do well there. But um, so I went to BJU for a little bit. And uh, after that, I left because my grandfather got super sick. My grandfather was my mentor. Mm. My dad grew up in the fire department and did a lot of shift work. So we spent a lot of time at my grandparents. Uh, And so me and my grandfather were super close, um, or at least, you know, in in retrospect to me, he was he was my mentor other than my father. Um, And so when that all happened, that was just like, you know, your world comes crashing in. And he actually got a brain aneurysm the day before he or the day of coming home from the nursing home oh. from having a first brain aneurysm. And then, you know, you had to watch him for the next two years, just sit there and linger and, mm. you know, death is at its door. But um, so that just that took another toll on me with the anxiety and fear, wondering when all that was going to happen. And then I got into drugs and I got into to big time partying. Um, I actually overdosed in January of 2008, January 20th. Um, and, uh, my parents had found me on the couch. I was drowning in my own pool of puke and saliva. Mm. Um, and so they rushed me to the hospital, but that didn't stop me. I kept going. And then eventually where we end up is the army. Mm. Um, and my dad said, either you got to get out or you got to get on. And so my dad made me go into the army or he didn't make me, I chose, but it was either that or go homeless, and I didn't feel like, you know, I'm too cute for the street. So, <laughs> but, well said, brother. but, uh, but yeah, so I ended up in the army. Uh. Um, and when I ended up in the army, we were 2010. Um, I went to basic training down in Fort Benning, Georgia. And not long after, probably about seven months, I was in Afghanistan, but you know, following, yep. um, following my, uh, my basic training. So I graduated in September. I was in Afghanistan the beginning of April, so closer to eight months. Okay. But um, from there, we were in what's known as Kunar Province. 
they call it Hell Valley, Death Valley. Mm. Um, there's actually about six, five or six documentaries about this specific area, the Kunar province, the Korangal Valley, everything that the base that I was at was the hub for all of those stories. Um, from bases being overran to guys having to shut down bases because they were just too, just in, in too disrepair, guys getting overran, all types of stuff. So when I say we went to the world's craziest place, no I, there are other guys that have had way worse deployments than I have. But when we went there, it, you, already, you walk out and you're like, oh my goodness, why am I here? It's like you're in a fishbowl. Yeah. Huh. And you're like, who decided to put this base here? This is stupid. And what was the point of that base being there in that, that particular area? So there was an MSRP, um, which is a main, uh, main supply route. And uh, basically what that is, is where they drive up the trucks to get to further up in Afghanistan. And we were part of that causeway. We were there to okay. make sure that everything stayed flowing and that the Taliban didn't do anything in that area to shut down main supply routes for up north. Okay. Um, so that's what that's what our goal was. But we were also there to engage with the local populace. We were there to win the elders. We were there to do a bunch of stuff. Mm. I had great leaders over there. But there were a few things that happened while I was there that really are what started the kickstart on what I would call my PTSD or basically my depression slash anxiety is more huh. what it would be known as. But there are spouts of PTSD in it that caused a lot of that. So when I was over there, um, I actually witnessed my first, not my first, but my only suicide that mm. I've actually seen. Um, so it was August 6th or August 5th. Um, I was over there and there was a guy outside and it was four o'clock in the morning. Um, the sun comes up three thirty, four o'clock over there. So for me to walk out the door and it be bright and shiny is like nothing. Um, and so the guy was sitting on a bench. Um, he was sitting there with his rifle. He was crying. And so I walk out and I'm macho man. You know what I mean? And, and, and I'm like, why is he crying? Like, this is so stupid. Why, why are you crying? Just go back to your bed. You know, it's four o'clock. What are you doing? Um, and I passed by him to go to the bathroom because the bathrooms weren't in the hooches. You had to go walk down and, and go. And then from there, when I came back, he was still in the same spot. Um, I said it again. I knew that there was something that should have been said, should have been done. Hmm. Um, didn't do anything. Walked back, laid in bed, and within less than three minutes, I hear pop, pop, pop. And he had taken his own life. Um, and the first thing that my leader had told me when I witnessed that, because I told them, I said, hey, I think I'm the last person that saw this guy. I just saw him less than three minutes ago. And he goes, good job. You got your first confirmed kill. That's what I was told. Man. And so that really kick-started a lot of that. And then the other incident that really did me in is we, I had shifted from Fob Bostic, so that was down in the valley, um, and we had moved to the top. So basically it was an OP called Mustang, um, and we were Overwatch. So we, we Overwatched Bostic to make sure that if mortars came in, pop shots, whatever it may be, we were there to... Um, do what we needed to do in order to protect them. So okay. that's what OP stands for, Overwatch um, position. Um, and so what happened was um, we were overwatching, and there was a little checkpoint that was down, down about two and a half kilometers outside of the base, and it's known as Checkpoint 2.5. Well, on Christmas morning... Um, we got put into what's called blackout. And what blackout means is somebody's been injured, somebody's been hurt, and you can't talk to your family. Um, wow. And so when that happened, we realized something was wrong. We started getting on the different, you know, the different high def telescopes, stuff like that, LRASs. Um, I'm trying to use terms that everybody would understand. But oh, I know what an LRAS is. Do you know what an no, LRAS is? I don't. I didn't think you did. <laughs> but so we started getting on all that stuff, and we realized that one of our medics had been shot. And the problem wasn't that he had been shot, but they couldn't get him out. Huh. Uh, and so he was actually stuck there for about six to eight hours, and he had been shot in the face. Um, and not just that, but the village across the river and then the two draws that were behind him were all ambushing him, and there was probably in the realm of three to 500 um, Taliban that were shooting at Whoa, them. Man. So 
Um, and there was only about 25 guys in that little checkpoint. Now, I was not in the checkpoint. I was up at the overwatch. But you sit there and you got to watch all that. And we're, I was a mortarman, so we're firing mortars. And we're trying to light up the hills to make sure that guys stop. And there's just nothing you can do. And we ended up, he ended up dying on the way. He made it to the base, made it to the gate, and breathed his last breath as they were pulling into the gate. Mm. Um, and the reason why that stuck with everybody is because he wasn't supposed to be there. Huh. He had actually taken a guy who had four kid, who had four kids. He had taken his spot to make sure that that guy could spend Christmas with his family wow. on wow, on the tube, while he had just gotten married two months prior. And mm. so he wasn't even supposed to be there. And as a medic, you're not even supposed to jump up on the gun like that. You're supposed to hang back just in case somebody gets hit. He chose to be that leader that jumped up and, you know, ended up passing away because of it. But those two incidents yeah. right there, the question of why him and the question of why not are the two big questions that really led into my journey. So when I got out, life slows down. Yeah. Um, you now, know. can I ask you a question? Yeah, go for it. When that, when that superior said to you, um, congratulations, you just got your first kill. Was that an overtone or that sentiment, that response to that man's suicide, was that commonplace? I know that it shocked you, but was that how people had just calibrated to deal with death? And is that how they expected you to respond as well? Or was that abnormal? It's, it's abnormal. I think that okay. he was just in a dark spot of his own. Yep. And so a lot of time... In the military, humor is what allows for us to get through. But Roger. as we know, um, as people, humor tends to blockade what the truth is behind it. Okay. And it just masks the feeling, yeah. and suppresses it. Exactly. Totally. Exactly. So it's just to like, okay, this is how I can move on from this situation. Mm, fair enough. Right, right. Sorry to cut you off. Oh, no, you're good, man. Okay, so, so you get out. It all slows down. So actually, I, I, I re-upped. in the. I, I went and worked for a colonel. Um, I worked for, uh, his name is Colonel Eifler, Brian Eifler. He's in charge of all of Alaska right now. Mm. Um, and I also worked for Sergeant Major um, uh, um, uh, David Clark. And da he is actually out, but he works for Berkshire Hathaway. He's the, the head li uh, VA liaison for them now. And okay. so I had two really cool leaders they were the best leaders I've ever had outside of one other guy. Um, and they really helped mold me, but they helped mold me as a person. But this continued to fester, especially because I got a lot of downtime and I started realizing what's going on. Um, and it wasn't until I started taking supplements while I was lifting, I took a pre-workout and the pre-workout kicked me into hyperdrive uh. and my anxiety wow. just snapped. And ever since that moment right there, it was like, it was like pedal to the metal. I couldn't understand why my body, it was like my body just went into some sort of shock. Wow. Like, you know, with all the chest pains, the, the, the mind racing, the, the constant twitching of the eye, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I stayed in because I thought I could fight it. And then I went down to the line again and realized that something wasn't right with my legs. My legs were acting up. And I turned around and ended up having uh, floating kneecaps. So they made me get out. They said, you can either go to finance, you can go drive a truck, or you can get out. And I was like, what happens if I get out? They're like, we give you disability. I said, I'm done. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> you're going you're gonna to pay me and I don't have to drive into bombs? Here. Yeah. yeah, let me take that. Let me wait. Um, yeah. Up. So I got out and then I came to White House. Actually, I got out February 28th, 2015. Uh. And Hawaii is six hours behind at that time. Right. So I flew in. I flew in on a red eye that night. I landed at six in the morning, March 1st, which was a Sunday. Man, you're good with dates. I know. I'm um, like trying to I'm good with dates, but I also it's watched today. last week's episode, and you're bad with dates. So <laughs> hey. you said Halloween was on, you said Halloween was on a Tuesday last year. So Touché, this Robert. this was in like fact that. on a Sunday. This was in fact <laughs> on a Sunday. I believe you were preaching, 
And um, I don't really remember because it was 8 o'clock in the morning and I had just gotten off a 10-hour flight. Uh, and I was actually in the seats for the 8 o'clock or mm -hmm. 8.30 service. I can't remember what it was this at is the at time. at Langley? At Langley. Right. Yep. Okay. And then ever since then, I didn't leave. Uh, and so, um, but from that point well, you, on. You've left. Well. You've gone home. But you, but you, you yeah, stays. yeah. I don't stay stays at here the every church. night. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah. So uh, then I, then when civilization kicks in and all that other stuff, you know, you realize that people outside the military are nothing like people inside the military. So then your frustration just increases. In what regard? And yeah, um, unpack that. So a lot of times people in the military have ways of thinking. They have seen things that people outside the military can never imagine. Mm. And so when somebody complains huh. about something so small and insignificant, whereas I've seen crazy stuff, it took me a while for me to be understanding of mm. that. Wow. Like it took me That's a good, while man. for people to, for me to understand what people have dealt with in their own lives and not try and treat my own as something that was far superior. And so like, it took me a long time to get used to that. Mm. Um, and so, and I put that in the really nicest way that I could, because there's other ways that I probably would have said it differently about five years ago, but, right, right. <laughs> and so after that, um, I just went through a series of law, you know, a lot of alcohol at the beginning of my time out of the military, trying to understand why this all happened. Why am I back here? I lost my rank, so I lost my title as a person. Mm. Um, I've lost what would see my value. Um, and now, um, back in 2020, um, I dealt with a significant life event. Um, I dealt with two. Um, I had a breakup but I also had found somebody and both of them were, I struggled with the identity at that point because uh. one didn't, one couldn't figure out why we needed to break up, but just felt like we did. And I thought that was somebody that I was going to progress in life with. Um, but there was no reason why that ended. And then I had somebody else that, who is now my wife, it took uh. me three times to get her to, <laughs> to, to say yes, Three's but a charm, baby. well, she didn't even say yes on the third time. <laughs> what did she, she called say? me on, and she was the fourth. She she just kept saying, she kept giving me that. Uh, I'll think I'm about just it. not ready. I don't know if it's God's will yet, Sarah. With, yeah, I know that's what Sarah. I'm saying. But no, We're now have we her on next week. <laughs> <laughs> Set the record now straight. We, <laughs> now we've been happily married for ten months. Mm. Um, but leading into that season. I found this book not mm. long after. It's called Rest in War. And this book right here guided me in the direction that I felt like I needed to go. I think I actually found this closer to 2021. Um, and maybe, I can't remember, but it was in that realm. This book really kick-started me in my journey of mental health mm. and truthfully understanding as a military guy, not that this has anything to do with military, but right. the book title is called Rest in War by Ben Stewart. And so the Shout title- Shout out to Ben Stewart, pastor of Passion City Church in DC. I can't commend that book enough. It is such an incredible, enlightening read. Rhythms of a Well-Fought Life. It's, uh, it's, it's yeah. a good one. Yeah, it is. It's a great book, and I hopefully he'll sponsor us after this. <laughs> but <laughs> Maybe just you. Yeah, maybe yeah, just right. me. Maybe just me. Um, but yeah, so that book right there really kick-started everything off. Um, ben Stewart talked to me through that book in a way oh. that I've never understood mental health. I've seen two different counselors over my time of getting out of the military. Both literally looked me in the face and said, I screwed this all up. Mm. And I was like, eh, I, I don't think I'm ready to go back and see a counselor. So I had to find other avenues. I wow. talked to pastors. I talked to um, just individuals. And I really had a hard time relating until I found this book. And, and I don't know why. There's no specific reason why, but that book right there just really helped me jumpstart the understanding of a mental health journey that I'm going to be on the rest of my life. So, so Josh, I remember, I remember the day specifically that I saw you in the foyer where you walked up to me and said, hey, <clears throat> have you ever read Rest in War? I got dear friends that um, serve at Passion City and... Um, it was when Ben Stewart was actually doing a series mm -hmm. through that book, and he had gotten me a copy. 
And um, and it was like it was rather arbitrary as to how you found it. Mm-hmm. I, I think the the title caught your attention, and it just so happened that I knew about it. Um, and it, you know, you said, "Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm starting to read it." I I opened it up, and I really like it. And then it was soon thereafter that I remember talking to you where you said, dude, this book is changing my life. It's wrecking me. You said a lot, like, I mean, as far as, and truly, brother, really insightful just about your own personal self-awareness of, you know, the things that kick-started, kick-started your anxiety, that trauma, things that then lent to it lack of identity, the label that you once mm-hmm. had, that be by way of ribbons or title, rank that you now lost, being now back home um, due to a disability. And all of these compounding effects really created this mental mm-hmm. you know, dysfunction, if you will. Mm-hmm. Talk to me about, for those that are listening, viewing, that would say, hey, there's a lot of that whether I've been through trauma or not, and many of us have. Why? Because it's 2023, and it's Mm -hmm. freaking crazy out there. It is. And so you can go through trauma in your own upbringing, your own dysfunctional experience of watching a mother-father fight, addiction, a myriad of things. Give me some benchmarks that were really the liberators that created a freedom or a wherewithal that helped you walk out your own health. Okay. So, um, before I even start on that, I do want everybody to know I have the best family in the world Mm -hmm. and the most supportive family in the world. And I know like, and as I'm sitting here listening to you, I was also thinking, I'm like, I don't think I made that clear enough on my life journey that my family, even though when I walked through everything I walked through, my family were standing right beside me the whole way. And my dad made that tough decision to say, hey, you either got to get on or get out. Um, And so, and I know that your father pretty much did the same. And so like, I want people to know like, hey, I have the most loving family. My mom, my dad, my brothers, my Mm sister-in-law, they all supported me through so, my grandmother, my grandparents all supported me through so much. My aunts, uncles, I had so many prayer warriors. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't even understand you when, when you're going through situations, people don't even understand how many people are praying for you. Um, And so I I did want to say that first, but some benchmarks that I did have um, is Number one, I started to realize that um, doing things such as forcing yourself into a culture, and I, and, and I don't want to say this the wrong way, but like forcing myself into a church culture constantly huh. and not allowing for myself to sit in things um, really helped. COVID was the best thing for me. Huh. It forced me to sit. I wasn't able to come here and serve three days a week. I wasn't able to go play cornhole or whatever other stuff that I do um, on the on the back end. I had to sit and I had to focus on me. And then really, it wasn't the first layer of of COVID. It was back like, I guess, January of 2021, where they forced us to shut down again. Um, And there was very limited things that were going on. All right. So hold up. So hold up. So marry those two. Because in one sense, you said you forced yourself into a community that didn't allow you to sit. So you had to get out of your comfort zone, cultivate Mm -hmm. relationships, communicate, process externally and verbally, I'm assuming. Yeah. And then, and then you said, but then COVID caused you to sit. Yeah. Talk to me about the benefits of why one helped, but then the other helped even though you had initially you had to get out of it. Does that make yeah. sense? I, I get what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, I think it, <laughs> it's my, uh, yeah, See, sure. Well, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, sure. Well, we both have those crazy minds. So <laughs> totally. I totally got it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I know he didn't, but he, him and John are like yeah. super binary. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> way, think way deeper than we yeah, do. Right. We're surface guys. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so we have, so we have went before, I was, I was here like okay. three, four nights a week. I'm mm. trying to force myself into these positions to keep myself 
ingrained in a culture of, you know, godliness. I want to make okay. sure that I'm surrounding myself with the right people. I want to make sure that I'm constantly surrounded by God, the word, worship, all mm. these at prayer, all these different aspects. But so to a degree, getting out of your own head and into correct. godly community and correct. that culture. But sometimes when we do that, we overextend ourselves in those positions. Okay, mm -hmm. right And on. so which a lot of times we hear in the church world as burnout. Yep. And I know you talked about burnout a couple of weeks ago, or maybe it was last season, but we talk about burnout where because we overextend ourselves That's so right. much, now we can't, we can't take everything in. So our cup is constantly filled and we can't allow for ourselves to allow for it to deplete. So much like a battery, I like to fully charge myself and let myself wind down. It's unhealthy to charge a battery at three quarters. You have to let the battery die down in order to recharge it. Mm -hmm. And so for me, when COVID happened, not the initial COVID, because that's when it a lot of the, the stuff happened where my mental health really plummeted. Okay. But the second part of COVID, when we kind of got re-shut down for a couple weeks, it was like three or four weeks, huh. we couldn't go out in public. They shut down the restaurants. They shut down. Um, I think we couldn't come to, to, we could come to church, but we couldn't come to certain events. And there was only a yeah. certain amount of Limited people. Uh, yep. yep. And so because of that, I was forced to sit. Hmm. They shut down everything, and then that's really when I started to dive in and realize, God, you want me to fully dwell. Because, I mean, like, by nature, I'm an extrovert. Right. I like to think I'm an introvert just because I want to be a part of that group, but <laughs> I'm totally not. Do you want to be part of that group? <laughs> I, sometimes I just want people to leave me alone. <laughs> but, that's understandable. But... um. <laughs> But yeah, and I mean that in the nicest way because you yeah, know owning nice. owning a business with my dad, my brother, and my mom like there's just your phone's blowing up all the time, yeah. um, and so I I kind of want to be a part of that. But I know by nature, God has placed me on this earth for relationship. Mm -hmm. But my relationship with Him suffered because I was trying to please all the other relationships of my life, and so that could while while be it. Uh, serving, you know, I was on the worship team. I was trying to serve every chance that I got, right. um, and necessarily for a, a a worship pastor, that's great. You have somebody that's willing to step in every chance that you get. Totally. But for the person doing it, sometimes it can it can hinder because now you're forcing yourself into an environment that you're not necessarily always prepared for. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and good, so when I hit that stage of complete burnout and had to sit there. Now my business during COVID never stopped. Huh. Actually, we got the busiest we had ever been at the time. Hmm. Um, and so we, I was able to work. So I was able to get out, fill my cup with talking to people. But then when I got home, I had to, I had to spend time with just me and God. There was no other thing that I could do. And so I really ended up studying. I really ended up finding a couple different books. This Rest in War being the best one that I could possibly find. Um, I know John had given me uh, emotionally, what's it, emotionally healthy, healthy spirituality. spirituality. That one, the first time, not good. <laughs> Second time, fantastic. That's a two-time two reader. So yeah, two for all those people that, that didn't like it the first point. time, yes. for all the people that didn't like it the first time, read it a second. Yeah. All you have to do and, is read this book twice. Yeah. <laughs> and so, the incentive. yeah. But uh, that book really helped me a lot, understanding that relational aspect. And then from there, um, outside of that, I mean, my first benchmark was just when I read the Bible, it had been a period of just an insatiable desire mm -hmm. just to constantly mm -hmm. dwell in it. We've um, talked about that before too. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and like, that was like my first thing because I'd always read the Bible and I, I've been in church my whole life. I mean, I'm, I'm 35 now, believe it or not. Um, I'm You're pretty quite good. May I yeah, add? I know. I look pretty young. Um, it's the moisturizer. <laughs> I don't use moisturizer. It's the beard oil. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so I, once I started to read the Bible and actually fully understood, and I think 
you know, even my mental health continuing to grow. Landon did really well a couple of weeks ago, allowing for me to understand like, hey, this point's here, this point's there. Right. So, um, and so I started to be able to do that on my own, not mm. through somebody else. Um, and then my prayer life started to pick up and I mm. realized that. And then my time of worship started to pick up and little by little things just started to my benchmark started to be like little things like that. My relationship started to pick up. Over that time, Sarah and I, we kept constantly going back and forth as to what we were going to do. Are we going to date? Or are we not going to date? Are we going to date? Or are we not going to date? And it was like, it was like good Sounds grief. like quite the indecisive yeah. relationship. You did a lot of convincing. <laughs> yeah, is she well, convinced to stay married well, or is she unconvinced? <laughs> now, she's Where are con- we at now? She's convinced now. Okay. Yeah, it only took a ring and a trip to Colorado. I'd appreciate hearing that from Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but to go back into it, that relationship right there, and I know we're not talking about relationships, we're talking about mental health, but this all plays into it. Absolutely. The relationship, mm. once I realized my mental health was ready for her, mm. oh, once good, I man. could allow for her, myself, to give what I needed to to her, I don't think that if she would have said yes, I'd be married. Mm. Huh. Up until when she actually did. Wow. And wow. that's because my mental health played a lot of that. And I feel like my benchmark was ultimately marrying what is now my best friend. Wow. wow. Um, mm. And so because of all that, because of allowing for myself to slow down and allowing for myself to do benchmarks and allowing for myself to finally spend time with God Mm. because, and, and, and I can talk about this in a second, like we're Psalm 23. I've talked to you. I've talked to Becca. I don't know if you've heard this yet, Cam, but I was on the call yesterday. Well, I know you were on the call, but Oh, I did go through the whole thing. Didn't I? (laughs) Um, Oh, well, well now it's your turn. Um, (laughs) But, uh, but yeah, so the, that whole scenario of realizing this is the steps that I need to take for me. And it's not for everybody, but these are the steps that really help me as a, as a person who has seen war, who has seen leadership, who has seen the military, Absolutely. who understands that idea of a rigid, a, a, like a rigid, like layout of life. Like there's A or B, there's no other decisions. Mm. And if we there's no gray area. Right. For, for my life, it, there's very little gray area. Uh. I live in a black and white life, you know, I... The, the, the Bible is black and white to me. Mm. I, I don't read into the Bible. I feel like God put it here for a specific reason. There's 40 authors, 66 books written on three continents over the course of what, like a couple 1500 years. 1,500 years. And there's a reason why they all match up. Amen. And so for that right there, I, that, that allowed for me, that passage of Psalm 23 really was the final benchmark as well as marrying Sarah that allowed for me to understand, I think I'm at that point where I'm starting to build off that mental health. Hmm. So, you got anything you, got anything you want to say? I, I have got a question, something. but I don't want to throw off wherever you want to go. I just want to say this. I, Josh, I have watched you. So, you know, like you stated, you know, 2015, 16, I have had a front row seat of just watching your maturity and watching the ebb and flow of... Um, for, and, and for a lion's share, not even knowing that you were dealing with, you know, post-trauma and the stress and this anxiety, it, it's only been rather recent in a few years past that you've tipped your hand to, mm-hmm. this was a, this is a real struggle. This is part of my journey. This is what I'm giving concentrated effort to. But I just want to say, and I want to say this to tee up what you told us yesterday um, about Psalm 23. I have sat and watched you specifically as a worship leader here, and I've just watched, and I said to you maybe months ago, just an anointing on you. And, and that anointing has a lot to do with your degree of comfort. You've grown incredibly comfortable in your skin, um, your degree of depth, your degree of heart, your degree of feel. I, I, like sometimes I watch you and I, I really appreciate your sensitivity for those that you're leading. You're not just leading and 
you're like a, a bull just saying, follow me. I'm, 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 I'm going into the, to the holy place. It's a real, hey, let me take you by the hand and, and really get you eyes wide open to see the majesty and the grandeur of God. And then let's, let's approach him through that lens. And I've just watched you grow to where I've thought, man, God has, God has really done a deep work in you and now you pour out from that place. And that's quite different from a young guy that's just a gifted musician. You've seen him, I've seen him, Boots has seen him, Beck has seen him, Mike has seen him. Just guys that are gifted in their skill, their craft, but not to say it's all about them, Mm -hmm. but there's a depth and a heart that's lacking that you know it when you I see somebody and you know they've been through it and they've came out the other end of it and they're deeper and better for it. And I've just witnessed that in your life. And then yesterday on, on this call, you spoke of Psalm 23 and it sort of crystallized for me. Oh, oh, this is what Josh has been anchored in mm-hmm. that's provided that. Do tell. Yeah. Do tell. Well, I do want to I do want to give a shout out to Jesse and... Mm. being the worship pastor and Aramis and, 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 and all of our other worship leaders, such as Dave and Corey. Um, we've had, uh, uh Dave Thompson. Mm. We've also had other people such as John McGowan and, and a few others. And those, those guys have poured into my heart so mm. much. And so when you get it's to see those active leaders, people don't realize when we go to other churches, um, I travel a lot. Um, to go see my brother and, and, and other places. And typically we end up in other churches and the, the way that our worship team leads is 10 times different than anybody else. Huh. Um, and I know that sounds weird. It's just for the community that we have, our worship leaders are ordained and anointed by God. And that's not including me. That's, that's those guys. Amen. I, I don't, I don't like to talk about myself with all that stuff. I don't feel like I'm even in a league with those guys. They have prepared me Wow. Exactly where I need to be. And that's why Jesse's a pastor. Mm. That's why Jesse is there. It's not because he's a leader. It's because he's a pastor. He has helped guide a lot of us into that. So um, did you want to ask your question or should I break down this real quick? Let's just go to Psalm 23. All right, cool. So Psalm 23 was always a big thing for me. Um, I know it was something super weird. He doesn't, uh, uh, he being Ben Stewart, doesn't really break it down this way. He does bring it up. Um, And so that verse, I just focused on that verse. And I went, what makes that verse so different? Um, And so for me, this is how I think of things. I like to break it down. Um, I like to make it a little bit simpler for me to read. I'm a simple man. You like to uh, make complex matters plain and simple. We get it. Yeah, that's why me (laughs) me and my mom danced to simple man at my wedding, believe it or not. Uh. Yeah, which makes really good sense that I'm on simplexity. Um, so, <laughs> Shout out, Mom. <clears throat> please sponsor us, Leonard Skinner. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or Mom can but, sponsor us with those peanut peanut butter oh, chocolate yeah. balls. Chocolate bars. It's the it's the peanut butter bars. Yeah. Oh, oh. I, I thought, had some I th- I this. They no, came... no, they're bars. Oh, well, I had I'm some not. this weekend. I almost brought you some, but they yeah, clobbered. Would've... They clobbered them, man. Oh, no People doubt. People eat them. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're yeah, like, no, I, like I little, imagine they don't like linger little long. crack bars. Yeah. Um, nothing but sugar. It's just straight sugar. Totally. Um, but anyway, so the uh, so Psalm twenty three. <laughs> <laughs> back to <laughs> let's get back to this. Um, but yeah, so Psalm twenty three. How do we identify Psalm twenty three? A lot of people want to look at the pronouns and, and the and, and the way that the words are nouns. They want to jump into the concordance. They want to go through Strong's and all this other thing. And I went, how do I break this down easy enough for me to understand? Because when I start breaking out my concordance, yeah, it's good luck. It's going to be good a rough luck. night. I had a I, I had a great I had a great Bible teacher, Mister Mister Jack Wilson. Oh, and he, the silver fox. Yeah, the silver fox. He was great, <laughs> and he taught me how to use my concordance. He was fantastic oh, at that. Okay. And so he helped, he helped these, these kind of thought patterns I always attribute to really good teachers. Mm. And His so, son Mark is a simplexer, by the way. Uh-uh. Is he? He's a big fan? Yeah, well. Big fan? Did we send him <laughs> a shirt? That far. No. <laughs> <laughs> but he anyway. Just subscribed one time on YouTube. Yeah, we yeah. appreciate it. <laughs> Is that, JK. You know everybody by name. Is that? Is that That's right. boot stuff. <laughs> yeah, I've got a long list of them. But uh, yeah, so it starts out with, the Lord is my shepherd. Let's just think about that thought pattern right there. Mm. Who is God? 
And that was the first thing. I need to know who I'm following in the battle. A lot of times people want to throw rank. They want to throw image. They want to throw status. Not meaning you, but I'm just saying because you're a pastor. I don't mean that anyway. Yeah. Now I feel awkward. Um, <laughs> but we have, you know, they want, they want, why, why should I follow you? Oh, I'm, I'm this person within yeah. this organization. That's right. But this right here. This is a defining moment. He doesn't say, I'm God, you should just follow me. He mm. says, no, the Lord is my shepherd. Mm. So a shepherd guides, a shepherd leads sheep into a fold. Amen, he man. does all these different things. So now I know I can follow him. And why am I following him? Because I shall not want. Mm. That's the reason why. Because he's going to take care of every single need that I mm. have. That's Whether or not that's the need that I think, it's the need that I need. Wow. And a lot of times we, we don't, we think that we need to have, and Steve preached this message, gosh, it's probably been four or five years. And it was on, um, Romans eight twenty eight. Um, all things work together for good for them. Yeah. Those that know. are calling according yeah. to us. Absolutely. Thank you. You're the Bible. You're let's the Bible scholar. And I'm out not. here, shall we? <laughs> huh? I said, let's get that concordance. Yeah. Right. But yeah. So, I mean, it's not based off of our want. It's based off of our need. Amen. And a lot of times we fail at that. We we wonder why we pray and we don't have these things happen. Mm. And it's because it's 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 that right. That's there. right. Um, and so I realized, okay, I'm following God and I'm following because I don't I won't I won't want. You know, he'll he'll take care of everything that I need. And so the first thing that you would think is when you're going into battle, let's go into battle. No. We prepare. And so that's why we go through basic training. That's why we do all the things that we do. So he makes me lie down beside the green. Uh, he leads me beside the still waters and he lets me lie in the green pastures. Good. So he's forcing me to rest, mm. which right here again, rest and war. Mm. He's forcing me into this place of rest. He's forcing for my body to recuperate. He's forcing me to spend time with him. Wow, He's man. forcing me to get a good prayer life. He's forcing me to read the word. He's forcing me to worship him because the chief and highest end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And how can I do that if I'm so focused on everything else? God. And so for I think me, we just found our soundbite for the week. <laughs> yeah. Well, right there. <laughs> He said, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, you did. So Mersons like to say, yeah, and so if they want to keep going on with the conversation. <laughs> Just a heads up. My wife pointed that out, and we all like started paying attention, and she was exactly right. Huh. Like, Mersons will just be like, so. <laughs> <laughs> Which means, yeah. let me let, continue. Let, let, yeah. Enough. Yeah, that's, a, that's enough. Um, but yeah, so lets me lie down in, in, in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. Mm. And that's right there. And it's not a place of, he doesn't say he wants me to go spend time with him. He wants me, he leads me beside the most peaceful areas. There's nothing better than sitting next to the water as you are a Miami fan. I know that. Mm -hmm. And so you love the water. Yeah. Um, I particularly I, like pools. So yeah. oh, you don't like the water. I, I do. Do you well, like boats? I don't know if you know this or not, but a pool is water. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, but I'm talking about a bubbling brook. Like if, if you hear a bubbling, you're not going to find that in pool, Miami either. <laughs> but I know what you're after, partner, and I'm with you. Yeah, I <laughs> wish you would have called me little partner, but I guess you realize that I'm bigger than you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so you lead. You know that water right there. That that there's nothing better than waking up in the morning and going to the beach and listening to the mm, waves crash on the water. There's nothing better than sitting out by the river and hearing the water pass over over the rocks. You know, there's nothing better than that. Or sitting out in a field, looking up at the stars, feeling the hay and the wheat flow over you. I know it sounds weird to think like that, but just from both experiences that I've had, like those are my places where I can just find rest. Right. And, and so, I love what you're saying, buddy, because so often our idea of being prepared has a lot to do with a westernized thinking of, okay, I got to work, mm -hmm. I got to train, I got to do, I got to be busy, when in fact, it is so true and so counterintuitive, nevertheless, it's so God, that it, we prepare by sitting in his presence and being infused with his life, his refreshment, his respite, um, so that we have all that we need. As Peter says, you have everything that you need for life and godliness. So often we leave so much on the table of, by way of preparation right. because we think it's more about doing than being. Right. And hence, Mary and Martha. 
Right. Mary knew I'm sitting. Martha thought I got a I got a busy, and dude, that is a game changer. Right. A game changer for all of life. Not mm-hmm. just not just for those dealing with mental illness or trauma or stress, but for all of life. The fact that we don't know how to solitude and be still right. wrecks so much of who we are. Right, and, and and in today's society, and it doesn't matter whether you become a new believer first, or if you start working out, or if you start playing a sport, or whatever you you start reading. You set these high goals when you first jump into something, Absolutely. and you 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 pour yourself into it, and you don't realize that you need to sit back, get comfortable, form the habit before you start pouring everything into it. That's good, man. And so, and I pulled up this on, that's why I was on my phone. I know Becca was looking at me, but I was, I was actually pulling up because, yeah, well, because I'm trying to make sure that I'm trying to make sure that I follow the good layout. It's all about layout. Have fun. (laughs) Fun. We deviate oh. from the subject. She yells at us. Yeah. I do think she needs a mic back there. <laughs> yeah. So let's keep going. Okay. You got the so. <laughs> so. <laughs> but uh, no, because I'm going to get yelled at for time. And I don't want to do that. Because you get yelled at for time. Yes, I do. And so. That's another thing. But. <laughs> we go on and on. <laughs> yeah. But we already talked about the waters. We talked about sitting in the pasture and why do we do all that to restore our soul come on and restoration i'm in the i'm in the trades i'm in the construction restoration haps a, happens after a problem right mm-hmm. we never think of restoration before that's right before the problem but in psalm 23 the restoration happens before we walk into a problem it's, uh. it, it happens way before and like in my business we're all about preventative maintenance you do things before you have a major problem right on. and so we're all about restoring before it happens um whereas here that's exactly what god's doing and why does he do that because he's leading me in a path of righteousness for his name's sake mm. and it's all for his glory his honor his benefit but it's also for mine that's why we are led into righteousness. We could be led anywhere else. We could be led to our own devices. We could be led in towards what the world desires. We could be led into all these other things. And yet he says, no, just follow my path of righteousness because it's for my name's sake. It's like that big, we'll have a big G or J on our chest because now we're wearing that full armor of God because we've already been restored to the point of we're ready. Mm. We're ready for anything. And so because of that, um, because of that, his name's sake, because of that, we have a foundation of where we are, that firm foundation. We're building our house on the rock. We're not building it on the sand in quick preparation for the storm that's going to happen. Right. We're actually taking the time to build this house. And how many times have you walked in through a community after the builders have just thrown up like 15, 20 houses and then the home inspectors come in and they're like, yeah, that's wrong. That's wrong. That's wrong. That's wrong. And it's because we rush, we rush the foundation of the house. We rush all these things. And now we got to go back in to fix it. Mm. You always have, you always have time to do things a second time, but you never have, have time to do it the first. You know what I mean? It's one of those concepts of actually taking the time, restoring ourselves, Except. and go in there. Hmm. I know I got the <laughs> I got the smart hmm. Let me think yeah. about that. Um, so now do it right the first time. Yeah. Yeah. My grand, twice. Well, that's once. actually that's actually a Sam Merson statement. You always have right to do it. You always have time to do it, or you always have time to do it. Wait, you always have time to go back, but you never have time to do it the first time. Mm. Huh. And so that's what he always used to tell my dad growing up. And that's why it takes us forever to do anything, because <laughs> we're over there trying to make sure that we do it right the first time. Yeah, that's right. Um, and so, but yeah, so now we walk into this valley, into the valley, like you guys had a sermon series not long ago, but you're walking into the valley, but you fear no evil and you don't fear evil because you're a follower of Jesus, you fear no evil because he has prepared you for this moment. Yes, you follow him because obviously you're a follower of God, but you've done the preparation with God. You've Mm. gone into battle. You've gone into the word. You've gone into worship. You have gone into these other places, so you know how to handle this battle. Wow. Or at least you know people that know how to handle this battle and walk right through it. Like Sarah and I, we walked first year marriage. We were walking through a couple different battles, and it's nothing major. It, it, it's life with somebody. You're living with somebody new for the first time. You're trying to make sure that this guy who offends everybody doesn't offend her who's always offended by this guy. <laughs> and so, like, 
So you have all these different things. And because of that, there was, there was a lot of preparation that was done, which is why we don't have as many problems as the average person would have in a new marriage because the time that we were able to spend, because God was preparing our hearts because you don't have marriage problems. You have problems that happen before marriage that come into marriage. And just like this walk with God, you have these. You need you, to learn from this guy. Try it. No, don't do that. Um, Anna. It's a long process. Get together with Sarah and Josh. Yep. You but, got cam problems. <laughs> <laughs> cam problems. So we have, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Mm. And it's because of that. We already have that preparation. But then we also know he's with us because he's walked through that fire. He's walked through all these situations that we've been preparing. He's been laying this out. He's like, hey, in our time with God, we're communing with him. And he's like, hey, this is something that we may walk into. This is something that we may walk mm. into. And I mean, that's the whole journey of the Israelites, right? They, they walk through so many different journeys of life that we can prepare just for about anything through the Old Testament. A lot of people don't want to read that. They forget about it. They want to know Jesus is the good Jesus, but they don't want to know about the work that was done before Jesus came. Hmm. And so a lot of that happens here. And your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Knowing that he's that shepherd is that comfort. Knowing that he's that guide. Now, like if you ever go somewhere and you don't have a tour guide or you don't have somebody that's leading you in a direction, like in the army, we used to like to go with our sergeants and our NCOs because they knew where they were going. The minute that we got stuck with a lieutenant, we knew we were going to get lost. Mm. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely knew. That was it. Except for a few of them. I had, I had really good officers, but there's some times where you're just like, how did you make it through, man? <laughs> and in this scenario, we know that God knows our exact path. He created us. He formed us. And he knew from the moment that he, he knew before we were made exactly how our lives were going to lay out. And because of that, and because we're so foundational in him, we know right then and there we're going to end up where we need to end up. But not because of, not just that, but I also want to bring into the idea of our first commandment is to love God, our second commandment is to love others. And because we're foundational in God, we know that we're loving him through this scenario. We hmm. know that we're loving him through this whole process. Because verse 5, it says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Why would he say that right after we just walked through a valley? Why would, why would he say that? There, there's no other reason to say that other than you loved me through this valley. You trusted me enough. So now you have to go show that love to others. There's, there's others that could potentially bring you back in that valley. Now we're going to put a test right in front of you mm. and we're going to see how you do. Mm. And that's why he anoints our head with oil. Because of the fact that we're about to walk through this. We just walked through all this. And he knows that this is another tough scenario, but we're commanded to do this. That's why he says enemies. He doesn't say, you put my father or my mother or my brother, my sister, my best friend. He doesn't put the people that we want there. He puts the people that knows that we're going to be tested. Because this whole journey that we've been on, this whole time, we've been on this journey that's preparing us for all of this. That restoring, that laying by the water, that sitting in the field. We've been preparing for this whole journey here. And so in order to get to that point of anointing our head with oil, because of the fact that we're sitting at that table with people that we don't really necessarily want to be with. And, our and that don't want to be with scenario. you. No, absolutely not. Don't want to be with I you. So like he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies means that even in the midst of the worst hardship or even in the midst of the most trying times, he encamps me and he, and he protects me and he keeps me. Mm -hmm. And you're right. If you don't see it that, hey, he's bestowed love upon me, then you're going to see it all through a negative lens when, in fact, you being comfortable knowing in the keeping power of Jesus, you being confident in he that, he that saved me and he that started a good work in me is able to keep me until that day. Uh, that, that's what helps you fight anxiety. Right and fight even when you got haters and you got critics and you got people that are plotting and planning. It's in that place that you can go, not only, it's in that place that you can go, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they right. do. That, that is only, I know that's the command of the believer, that is only possible if you have a firm foundation. Right. You can never muster that in the moment. Absolutely. You, you, you want to, you hurt somebody yeah but also you 
<laughs> yeah, but also you have the story of Stephen. I mean, the story of Stephen. That's when right. He's, when he's getting stoned, as he's falling down, mm. as he's getting stoned, Stephen is crying out like, Lord, do not hold this against them mm. w- when they go to seek your, your face. And again, it's because of everything that was done in preparation for that. There was a firm foundation. And notice how it doesn't say that the cup overflows after we spend time with them. The cup overflows after we have learned to love our enemies, after we've sat there mm. through the valley. We've already walked through this nasty, harsh time, and then now we're going to the enemy, and now our cup overflows? Why has that happened? And it's because we've been prepared. That's good. We're sitting there, the preparation's always been done, and the reason why all that happens is because surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all. Mm not just a few, all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And so those things right there, it shows what happens at the end. If you trust the process, that's what ends up happening. Amen. You should should take up an offering. (laughs) No, I'm not. I don't know where the money goes. I used to, I used to be a little, I used to have a little This program goes to the snack shack. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I used to I used to preach in my basement to my parents who would always wonder why they never gave me an offering. <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine if you're like, standing down there and you're just like, all right, we're, this time we're going to take up a love offering. For somebody the, comes out, out of the side it's door. It's Jeremy. He comes out with a, with a bowl, <laughs> a basket. Yeah. Oh, my old man, man. you say, if you can't put a little in, take a little out. <laughs> Yikes. That is, that is rough. I was old school. Yeah. That's back in those Pentecostal days. Well, sometimes we were poor. We stuck the 20 in. We're like, oh, is that a five? Yeah. <laughs> hey, I gave 15. You. Hey, I, there's I a guy Third Avenue did that one time. He had a 10. He wasn't willing to give it all. He was like, anybody bust this? Can I take? <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> that's, 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 that's by and large why we quit taking up an offering. You just yeah. put your money in the vat now. <laughs> yeah. It was a liability to do it. That's right. That's right. But, buddy, um, I cut you off. No, I was just going to say, getting ready to wrap up here, Josh, yeah. we definitely appreciate um, yeah. you being on and, and mm. just sharing your heart. And so, um, You're a deep well, brother. Yeah, that, that, I, was, I, that was the first time that I've heard the extent of your story. And, you know, yeah. um, I was just really moved by it. And I appreciate the, the boldness and mm. the bravery that it takes to open up about that. Um, and I just think it, it means a lot to us mm. and... I think it's going to mean a lot to the listeners as well. Um, the question I had that I just want to kind of wrap with is you talked a lot about how catalytic, if, if you will, that book, Rest in War, is. Mm-hmm. Can you just give a, a big picture synopsis of what that book touches on? And, and I know you said there wasn't like a real specific reason why it's been impactful, but just I don't know anything about it. Um, could you just speak to the gist of it real quick? Oh, oopsie. Almost knocked that over, but it's empty because I drink my coffee fast. (laughs) But I mean, it's all about like, so this whole thing is not just about PTSD. It's not just about anxiety. It's not just about fear. It's talking about your struggles and how to struggle well throughout it. So your valleys that you're walking in, these times and periods that are really difficult, it talks about how to prepare for those valleys, how to prepare for that time. So the rest and war part, I'll just read you the little bit of a back just because he wrote it and he does better. But it says, do you feel frustrated by a pattern of personal failures, overwhelmed by a chaotic culture and disillusioned by a lack of meaning in your life? Your struggles don't mean you're doomed. They're actually a sign you're alive and want to keep seeking what you're made for. You see, Jesus did not free you from struggle. He freed you for the struggle. Now it's a question of whether you will struggle well. And that right there, it was the empowerment that I was given by God Uh. to do my struggles, not Mm -hmm. take him. And and a lot of times when we pray, we pray, Lord, do this. We're commanding him, not, Lord, can you help me walk through this? Mm -hmm. He put it in your life for a reason. Mm -hmm. So why would he take it away? Yeah. Yeah. Help help me struggle well. Yep. And that book exactly. helped you struggle well. It, it, it definitely does. Okay. And continues to struggle well. It's actually like one of those books you read like every couple of years. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's one that you need to constantly keep at the forefront of your mind. That's good, man. Sweet. Well, again, man, we definitely appreciate you coming on today. Yeah, absolutely. Do. Um, we do. That was good. Even that though you're rich, upset bro. I didn't bring peanut butter bars. Yeah. Not, that, that, that. Next time. <laughs> 
next time. But we appreciate yeah, you guys. We're going to win them on the front end. <laughs> yeah. Service are here. Not anything. We yeah. appreciate you guys listening or viewing. Uh, you can go ahead and check us out on Instagram at Simplexity Podcast. Also follow us on uh, either Spotify or Apple as well. Love you guys. Love you guys. Oh